Um, okay, do some more. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Well, hello to everyone. Um, I'd like to start the presentation by saying that many providers believe that what I'm about to talk to you about, that the, the, the uh, field of cultural competence is not really very important for the work they do. Now, I would suspect that because you are on this call that you feel differently, that those of you that are on this call actually do feel that uh, cultural competence is important for the work that you do, but many providers don't. They feel that it's kind of sort of soft or uh, kind of related to, you know, relationships with, with patients and that that doesn't really have very much to do with health outcomes. And I am here to convince you otherwise, that the work that you do to establish a good rapport and good communication with patients who are of a different racial or ethnic or language background than you, the work that you do to establish a good relationship and good communication is as important to health outcomes as getting the medication right or getting the dialysis right. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll agree with me that this is a very, very important topic. So I'm going to start by just talk a little bit about the objectives for the next hour. Um, essentially, you will learn about three components of cultural competence in order to work more effectively with people from different cultures. Um, you will also learn how to communicate with patients, people in the dialysis community, and coworkers who are of, or of different cultures. And you will learn how to speak with others about cultural beliefs and practices that, they, that, that are different from what you are used to. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to be dealing with over the next um, hour. So the first, the first thing I'll talk about is this is a, a model that I developed. Um, I feel that there are three types of cultural competence, managing your prejudices, communicating across cultures, and understanding specific populations. Now, this is important because oftentimes when people begin to know something about cultural competence, they think that their job is to learn about the holidays or the food preferences or the religious beliefs of the populations that they're working with. They, they think that what cultural competence is about is only number three. Now, those things are important, and they're really fun if you if you're, have a little bit of an anthropologist in you and really enjoy learning about different cultures. It's really fun to learn those things, but they're, it's, not the only, it's not the only part of cultural competence. And as I'll show you, it may not even be the most important part. So let's talk about managing your prejudices. I will, I will first assert that we, that we all have them. Everybody, if you're a human being, then you carry some prejudices. You have some prejudices in your, um, in your brain, and many of them are probably unconscious. So I'm going to prove that to you. Let's start by looking at this fellow. Just glance at him, and look, is he honest? Is he lazy? Is he hardworking or manipulative? And what you want to listen to is just what's your gut reaction to him without really even thinking about it very much. What about this fellow? Is he honest, lazy, hardworking, or manipulative? This lady, is she honest, lazy, hardworking, or manipulative? And what about this guy? Is he honest, lazy, <laughs> hardworking, or manipulative? You know, everyone seems to get a chuckle from this guy. <laughs> So the, the point that I want to make is that when you look at these people, I would suspect that all of you had some kind of a, some kind of gut feeling about who these people are. But what do you know about them? Do you know what, what where they went to school? What they went? What they do do for a living? Whether they're married? Whether they're good to their children? Whether they beat their children? Essentially, you know nothing about them. And just by looking at them, within a second, you have a gut feeling about who those people are. That is, um, and that is part of, that is just part of being a human being. So now I'll, I'll tell you what mine is. I'm a little embarrassed about what my prejudices are, but I'll kind of t tell you um, what I'm thinking. When when I see somebody that has like a purple mohawk and lots of body piercing all over their all over their face and all over their body, I and lots of tattoos. Um, 
I'm uncomfortable. Now, I apologize to anybody on the call who might be offended by that. I'm not saying I'm proud of it. But when I see somebody like that, a purple mohawk, um, I am uncomfortable. And I have prejudice. I have feelings of prejudice towards those, that person. I feel like that's not a person I could connect with. And I have all kinds of thoughts and feelings about who that person is. Even before they open their mouth, I've kind of already prejudged them. So where do prejudices come from? Where do we, when you look at the four people on these, these on this slide, and when I look at somebody who has a purple mohawk, where do the prejudices come from? So here's the thing. When you have a first impression about somebody, it's not really a first impression. In fact, there's no such thing as a first impression. Or at least when you had your first impressions, you were a small child. Now what you have, you have second impressions or third impressions. When you see somebody that's like like the people that are on this slide, and you have a first impression about them, you're, you're, you're really reacting to somebody you have known in the past. These people remind you of somebody you met in the past. Maybe your mother that told you that, oh, those kinds of people are X. Or maybe you once had an experience with somebody whom you met many years ago. Or maybe they remind you of somebody that you saw on television. So when you have a gut reaction, when you have a first reaction to somebody, a first impression, or when I have a first first impression about somebody who has a purple mohawk, I'm not reacting to the person whom I'm looking at. I'm reacting to somebody that I knew in the past. It's not really a first impression. It's a second or a third impression. So what do you do about that? The first thing is, is to fess up. And what I mean is to, is to be honest with yourself, to be honest with yourself that there are certain groups of people whom you are uncomfortable with, whom you feel prejudiced towards. This, the, the next thing to do is to think, where did that prejudice come, come from? Is it, was there somebody I ever knew in my past that reminds me of this person? Did my mother or my grandmother ever tell me something about these people? Did I see somebody on television that reminds me of this person? To try to think that that the person that you're talking to is, is it, you're re, re, actually really reacting to somebody whom you've known in the past. And then as best as you can, you want to tell yourself that the person in front of you is different from anyone you've met in the past, that this is a unique individual, and that your job is to understand what's special about this person. If you take a couple of minutes to ask somebody where they went to school or whether they have children and to begin to understand the unique characteristics of the individual sitting in front of you, it can help to chip away a little bit, chip away a little bit about uh, uh, away from your feelings of prejudice towards that person. So why does it even matter? Why does it? Why does prejudice even matter? Even the secret ones. For one, they're pretty hard to keep them secret. Uh, people often will tell, they can know uh, whether you feel prejudiced towards them, whether you like them or don't like them. And that makes, turns out to make a big difference in how patients feel. So there are some studies, um, some studies about racial and ethnic concordance that say that patients prefer a provider of the same racial or ethnic background. But other studies, study, studies demonstrate that what a patient really wants is a provider of any cultural background who will listen to them. And not only listen to them, but demonstrate that they actually like the patient. People, people um, report, there are some studies that, re, that show that patients are more likely to adhere to a treatment plan. They're more likely to come back for services regularly. They're more likely to take medications appropriately. They're more likely to adhere or comply to a treatment plan when they believe that the provider likes them, simply likes them. When they don't believe that a provider likes them, or they feel, they kind of sense that the, pay, the provider feels prejudiced towards them, they are more likely to be non-compliant. And forms of non-compliant, particularly in, in your world of dialysis, are as follows. People fail to follow dial, dial, dialysis prescriptions, like they'll get off the machine earlier. They fail to take binders. They fail to bring all a list of medications to the dialysis facility. 
They fail to show up for the appointment for vascular mapping. They may fail to maintain dry weight or, or basically have too much fluid between treatments, fail to fill a new prescription, fail to refill a prescription as directed. They may skip a dose. They may too, take too much medication. They may prematurely discontinue medication. They may take a dose at the wrong time. Um, this is actually from a study that shows that many people take medications prescribed by somebody else. They may take a, a dose with prohibited foods, or they may store medication improperly. Now, those things occur, they occur when patients feel that they do not have a, a, of enough a trust or rapport with a provider. Either they will intentionally, like in the case of failing to take a medication uh, on purpose or failing to come in for dialysis or getting off the machine more quickly, they may do it in person or they may make mistakes. And they may do it by accident. And when they do it by accident, it means that there was insufficient communication between the provider and the patient. Um, insufficient communication, and we'll be talking a lot about that, is how do you ensure that the patient understood what you asked them to do and that, two, that they believe in what you said, trust you, and that they are motivated to do, to do what you've suggested. So when we start talking about communicating across cultures, this always makes me laugh. Um, you know, I've, I've sat through lots and lots of lectures about what it means to communicate effectively with uh, a patient from another culture. And typically what people say is they start with this advice, treat other people respectfully. My, that's my response, duh. And the reason I say that is because, of course, you, uh, all of you on this, on this call, I'm sure that you're all working in the healthcare field, you would never intentionally treat somebody disrespectfully. The problem is, is that oftentimes people may treat somebody disrespectfully without knowing, without understanding that different cultures perceive respectful behavior differently. So um, just before I, I, I go on to this slide, I, I want to tell you that for a while I did a little bit of work in Bolivia, and um, some pregnant women would come in, and the healthcare provider would look at them surprised and say, "Senora, you're pregnant again," and they never meant to, they never meant it disrespectfully, but the women who were now pregnant after their first, you know, their child was a year and they're pregnant again, would be so embarrassed and feel so offended that they, they didn't miss the tone of voice. They didn't miss the eye, the, the, the facial expressions. They knew that the provider was kind of looking at them somewhat uh, disrespectfully, even though the provider never intended to be disrespectful. So respect is a funny thing. It's something that is in the eye of the beholder, and we're going to be talking about ways to, uh, to treat somebody respectfully in the way that they want to be treated respectfully. So now let's look at the, the slide in front of you. Uh, we're going to be talking about a, a number of different cases. So here's the first one. Um, a Haitian woman on dialysis has been told to limit the amount of fluid she drinks. Her aunt brought her some medicinal herbal tea that is sure to cure her. The woman thinks to herself, this tea is more important than what the doctor says about how much fluid I should have. My aunt is a wise woman, and she has told me to take this tea. Um, so, so what's going on here? This, this woman, and I, I will say that um, the use of, of traditional medicines is very common in, in many, many uh, patients who've come from various parts of the world. And from Haiti, people oftentimes do bring medicinal herbal tea. It's apparently very, very commonly used. And um, it's commonly used not only um, among people who are um, uh, less educated, but even educated people will take herbal tea. So so in this case, she feels more of an alignment with her aunt, who's somebody that she trusts, than she does her doctor. She feels that, well, her aunt cares about her, loves her, and uh, obviously wouldn't, wouldn't prescribe something or wouldn't suggest something that was harmful to her. So the woman feels more of an alliance with her aunt than she does her, her doctor. And so she says, well, I'm not going to really pay attention to what the doctor says right now. I think what I'll do is, um, is I'll pay attention to what my aunt says, and I'll drink this tea, and I don't have to really limit how much fluid I take now because my aunt knows what she's doing. So there, there are, again, the the this is completely related to the relationship that the woman has with her her provider. Completely related. So let's go on to some other other um, examples, and then we'll talk about well, how do you ensure that you've established a relationship with your patient so 
that the patient can talk with you about what it, what her beliefs are, what she thinks she's going to do so that she will tell you about this herbal tea. If you don't have this conversation with this woman about her herbal tea, her medicinal herbal tea, she is likely to, um, to you know, to take too much fluid, uh, to take more fluid than you've recommended. So let's go on to the next one. Um, Mrs. Jones, a 67-year-old African-American woman, tells her dialysis nurse that she needs to cut her treatment time in order to pick up her grandson from school. The nurse is concerned about the adequacy of the dialysis for Mrs. Jones and tries to persuade her to stay the full four hours. Mrs. Jones replies that she prays to God every day and she knows he will make sure she is okay even if she leaves early. So a couple of things about this case. For one, there have been studies that show that the more religious someone is, the more deeply they believe in God, that that can actually sometimes lead to poor compliance. It's the idea that um, it's out of their hands and that uh, God will provide. And so that one of the things that as a provider you need to do is engage that person in the converse, on a conversation about their belief systems and to um, and, and to uh, the goal is to get them to a place where they see your treatment, in this case dialysis, as being consistent with um, with their religious beliefs rather than in conflict with their religious beliefs. So that it's about acknowledging encouraging people to um, continue to continue to follow um, whatever religious beliefs they are, whether it be praying, whether it be um, rituals that are, uh, that are found within their culture. But what's important is that you engage people in a conversation so that you can understand why it is that they may or may not be com complying. And again, we'll, we'll get to more about that in a minute. Um, a Haitian man has missed two dialysis appointments in the past two weeks. He privately believes that his illness is caused by the spirits who may be, must be angry with him. If he can perform the correct rituals to please them, he will get better. Let's go on to the next one. Um, an elderly man with little formal education is told by his doctor that he must take a binder medicine with food to ensure that his phosphorus level does not rise. He is given written instructions as a reminder. The man didn't really understand what the doctor was talking about, was, but was too embarrassed to ask a question. When he got home, he looked at the instructions, but the words were too big and confusing. He remembered the doctor said something about food. Hmm, that must mean I'm not supposed to take this medicine on an empty stomach, he thought. I'll take it once a day with breakfast. Now, this, this is an issue about health literacy, about patients who do not do not either read sufficiently in order to follow instructions or who simply don't understand the words and the concepts that you're presenting him with. So in this particular case, the poor man had never heard about phosphorus, doesn't know what that means, and didn't really understand what you were talking, what the doctor was talking about. He couldn't, he couldn't um, kind of process it, and he was too embarrassed, too embarrassed to say, I don't know what you are talking about. So... Um, you know, again, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be talking more about this, but it is really, really essential for you to put people at ease so that they are comfortable to say, I don't know what you mean. I don't understand. Okay, so here's um, there are here's a, and I apologize. I know the writing on this slide is a little bit small, but here's a good um, some really good questions to ask people. And I, I think from the cases will show you why why it's important for you to take the time to ask these kinds of questions. So it's, it's the mnemonic is ethnic. So E stands for explanation. Um, what do you think may be the reason you have these symptoms? What do friends, family, others say about these symptoms? So, for example, the man who believed that his ancestors or the spirits were angry at him. If you can uh, 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 create enough of a trust in that relationship, he may tell you that. He may say, well, I really think that my uh, renal failure is caused by the spirits who are angry at me. And then you as a, as a provider would say, in a, in a non-judgmental non -judgmental manner, please tell me more about that. Tell me more about your beliefs and, your, and your, your ideas. Tell me about the spirits. What would make them angry at you? What could you do to make them feel better? If you can engage them, a person in a conversation 
um, that that allows you then to in turn say, wow, it's really important that you perform that ritual. It's really important that you say that prayer. It's really important that you go to that traditional healer. But in addition, can we make some kind of deal here? You you do what you have to on your end, but also please come to dialysis regularly. If you don't have that conversation, people are basically dissing you. If you do have a conversation and let them feel like you are aligned with them, that you are a partner, that you are respectful of not only them as a person, but that you are um, not diminishing their beliefs, they will be more likely to play ball with you, more likely to engage in, in, in your world, more likely to show up for dialysis appointments. Um, similarly, what do friends, families, and others say about these symptoms? In the case of the woman who is taking the herbal tea, it's really, really important for you to uh, find out about her aunt and say, wow, boy, how wonderful it is that you have this aunt who obviously loves you so much. Um, T stands for treatment. What kinds of medicines, home remedies, or other treatments have you tried for this illness? Is there anything you eat, drink, or do on a regular basis to stay healthy? Tell me about it. What kind of treatment are you seeking from me? So in this case, then you would get more information about the tea. Please tell me more about it. And and in this case, it allows you to say, you know, to say this sounds like a uh, like an interesting treatment, and um, can we make an can we make an agreement though that you only take um, you that you drink this tea? I think it's a good idea. Don't agree, don't disagree at all. Think that your aunt must be a very lovely person, um, but can we make an agreement that you will only have as much of the tea as you're allowed of fluid? Um, the only the only caveat I would add here is that some uh, medicines that people bring overseas are harmful, meaning that sometimes they um, have bad things in them like lead. So um, you you can uh, there's a website from the National Institute of Health called the uh, National Institute of Health, the National Complementary and Alternative Medicine Division that. Um, has enormous amounts of information about uh, things like herbal teas or other home remedies, traditional remedies that people bring. And it's a good idea to check that to make sure that um, that the medications have, have been um, determined to be harmless or, uh, or, or at least um, that there's been some recognition as to whether or not there, there's a problem with them. Um, the next question, healers, have you sought any advice from alternative folk leaders, friends, or other people? That is really important because sometimes traditional healers may um, may either encourage people to, to come for services like dialysis or discourage them. So, again, you want to understand what what that person's, what the patient's world is and what kind of influences they are having in terms of following your medical advice. Um, negotiate. Negotiate options that will be mutually acceptable and they do not contradict, but rather incorporate your patient's beliefs. So things like uh, things like the the um, the the herbal tea, assuming that this herbal tea has not been found to have lead in it or anything harmful in it, um, to agree. Yes, you have that herbal tea, but let's agree that how much of it you can have every day. Um, intervention, determine all the interventions with your patients. They may include incorporating alternative treatments, spirituality and healers, as well as other cultural practices. And that you need to um, agree on what foods are to be eaten or avoided in general, when the, when, in general and when the patient's sick. And the last, also very important, is collaboration. Oftentimes, it, it's not the patient who is the decision maker. So, for example, if you're trying to make a, make a decision about what the patient eats or drinks, if you're trying to get the patient to alter what they eat or drinking in the case of dialysis, it may be very, very important to find out who's the decision maker in the family, who's actually making the food, preparing it, who's actually feeding the patient. Is it the wife? Is it the mother? Is the husband making decisions? And incorporate that person in the decision, in the whole treatment plan. In some cases, uh, when, pa when patients are are using traditional healers, it may be even appropriate to encourage the tra traditional healer to come or say, can we get on the phone with your healer and, and um, see whether there might be a way to have the healer be an advocate and an ally of yours rather than, um, than on the opposite pole. So, um, so in the case of the, the gentleman who didn't understand um, 
didn't understand how to take the binder medication and who was too embarrassed to say, I don't understand. Let's talk about this this question. Do you understand what we've discussed? Now, people may do that. Providers often will say, do you have any questions or do you understand what I've said? The problem with that is this. No one says no. Almost nobody says, no, I don't understand what you just said. Very few people have actually have the confidence to do that. They nod. They say, oh, sure, I understood. Do you have any questions? No, I have no questions. And they walk out the door not having understood what they're supposed to be doing. So what you need to do is you need to say, people, can you explain in your own words what you heard? Please tell me, please say in your own words what you just heard. That is the only way for you to know whether a person really understood. Um, it was a, a study done in New York where they, uh, patients were asked to take, excuse me, they were told to take two tablets twice a day. And then the, the test was, well, how many tablets do you take in the morning and how many tablets do you take in the evening? Patients could repeat. They could pair it. Take two tablets twice a day. But some patients were confused as to whether that meant a total of two or a total of four. Some some people were taking some people were taking one in the morning and one in the evening, and others were taking two in the morning and two in the evening. So even though they could actually say the words, "I'm going to take two tablets twice a day," they didn't understand. A lot of people didn't understand. So you, if you really want to make sure that people have understood, you need to ask them to please explain in their own words what it is that they're going to be doing at home. The other is this teach back or show me method. Now, um, one example I'll, I'll give of that is there was a very sad case of a father of a child that was about six months old that had simply had otitis media. She, this child had um, a ear infection, kind of a, a common ailment for for a baby, and the uh, the pediatrician prescribed oral antibiotics and showed the father how it was that he should draw up the liquid antibiotics in a syringe and put the syringe in the baby's mouth and just um, you know administer the oral by, uh, antibiotics that way. He sh- admit, he showed it. He demonstrated to the father how to do it. Uh, do you have any questions? No. The father said, no, I don't have any questions. I understand. Yes. The father went home. He um, he drew up the antibiotics into the syringe, but he forgot to remove the syringe cap. Or I shouldn't say he forgot to remove the syringe cap. He didn't know that the syringe even had a cap. So he put the syringe with its cap in the baby's mouth. He pushed the plunger. The syringe cap ended up lodging in the trachea of the baby, and the baby um, died. And um, obviously, this is a terrible terrible case terrible case and what um you know what what is clear is that what should have happened is that that father before leaving the office should have actually demonstrated should have demonstrated how he was going to administer the antibiotic at home if if they if he had done that then of course the pediatrician would have said stop stop you you need to remove the syringe cap before you actually put the syringe in the baby's mouth now, I don't know whether there are, is anything analogous to that in terms of the kind of care that your patients have to do, things that they actually have to do for themselves, maybe things around bandages or dressings around uh, their their uh, dialysis sites. But um, if there is, it's not it's not enough to explain it to people. It's not even enough to show them how to do it. You do not know whether people understand unless you have observed them doing it themselves. Now, in particular, when people are from another culture or they don't speak English, they in particular may be very intimidated and um, afraid of you and afraid to tell you that they don't understand or simply too proud to tell you they don't understand. So it's in those cases, it's even more important that you ask people to demonstrate for you what it is that they're going to be doing at home. Um, okay. Uh, Next case, Um, a Hispanic woman arrives at the dialysis facility for the first time. She is unable to speak English, but has brought her 16-year-old daughter to interpret. The charge nurse communicates with the patient through the 16-year-old. Towards the end of the treatment, the facility administrator tells the charge nurse that it's not correct to use a minor as an interpreter. 
The charge nurse tells the 16-year-old that she needs to bring an adult who speaks English next time. So here's what's important about that. Um, family members, friends should never be used as interpreters. They should never be used as interpreters, even adults. And the reason is that you have no idea how well the person speaks the other language or how well they understand English. So, um, for for example, um, a number of years ago, I was in French-speaking Guadeloupe on vacation with a family, with a you know whole extended family members, and my um, st stepmother fell off a, her a horse and she fractured a vertebra. She fractured a thoracic vertebra. And, of course, was rushed to the local hospital, and it was really quite terrifying because I was afraid that she was going to end up being um, a high paraplegic. And um, uh, so in my not-so-good French, I was trying to talk with the physicians, and I asked them, um, well, does it look like she's had any neurological damage? But in, even though my French is not so bad, um, I, I didn't know how to say neurological damage. And they were trying to explain to me that it didn't appear that there was any neurological damage, but I didn't know the French expression for there doesn't appear to be. So I couldn't even understand that. Then um, my stepmother had had an aneurysm as a young woman, and I didn't know how to say aneurysm in French. So uh, as it turns out, she ended up being medevaced, and she was you know, totally fine, and, and the story ended up happily. But for me, it was a firsthand experience of how terrible it is to be a family member when you're trying to understand and trying to communicate medical terminology in a, in a different language. There are um, other reasons as well. Um, there's a case in which a a, a man was being um, asked about his uh, his um, wishes re regarding DNR. He was asked whether whether he wished to be do not resuscitate or not. And it's uh, unfortunately the family member who was uh, interpreting for that patient was somebody who stood to inherit a lot of money when the patient died. And the providers didn't understand that there was a bit of a conflict of interest there. So it was like another example of how you really have no idea. You have no idea whether the person who's interpreting has actually got the patient's best interest at heart, or really how well that they understand one language or the other. The other is that family members may actually intentionally hold in, withhold information. They may not want to upset the patient, and so they may withhold information, not telling mom that she has kidney failure, or not explaining to dad that he could die if he doesn't have dialysis. The the family member who is interpreting may not want to may not want to upset the patient, and so they may withhold information. They may not tell the full, the full message. Alternatively, um, perhaps the patient has something in their history. Maybe they use drugs, or maybe they um, were with a prostitute, or something that uh, the the family member is embarrassed about. And when um, the family member is asked about the patient's history, the family member actually may lie to the provider. So for the, all of these reasons, for the fact that the patient's family member may not simply be bilingual enough, or they may be intentionally distorting or withholding information, you must never use a family member uh, to interpret. Um, it's really important to have um, trained interpreters uh, trained interpreters to to fulfill that that role, and if you don't, then there are good telephonic interpreter services like um, like the Language Line is one or Syracom. There are sort of uh, you know services by phone that you can use to call and use as interpreters. Don't definitely do not rely on family members, and you may not even. Uh, and rely on staff who are bilingual unless they've been trained and tested as interpreters. You don't know how well the staff members speak uh, one language or the other. They may be misunderstanding information. They may not have the medical terminology. They may be distorting the message that you're trying to get to the patient. So um, one question is, why don't they learn English? There are some, some people that feel kind of somewhat resentful towards patients when they come in and they don't speak English, and they say, why don't these people learn English? So 
first of all, they are learning English, and they are learning English at the same rate at the same rate as earlier immigrants. Today's immigrants do are, are no worse than than my grandparents were, or that the immigrants of the 19th century or the early 20th century they came here didn't learn English any quicker or faster than today's immigrants did. The problem is it's hard. It's hard to learn a foreign language. It's hard to learn English. And when you talk to immigrants who do not speak English, they feel very badly about it. They want to speak English. They may be trying to speak English, and they be, may, may be very sad or very uncomfortable that they cannot. So um, so the argument around, all oh, these people are too lazy, they should certainly learn English, is completely false. Uh, that's not what the data shows. The data shows that people today are learning as English as well as, as they did years ago, and that immigrants today want to speak English as well as, as much as any immigrants have throughout history. Okay, so again, regarding interpreters, the law requires any agency that receives federal funds to provide interpreters. Patients are not required to bring their own interpreters, and in most cases they should not use their own interpreters. Um, so that is part of uh, the Civil Rights Act. It's part of the Office of Civil Rights uh, Guidelines. And um, the Joint Commission has now um, issued new standards that state that only qualified interpreters should be used to interpret um, medical information. So let's talk about using nonverbal communication as a way. Um, whoops, sorry for the typo in here. First of all, facial expressions and gestures vary and can be easily misunderstood. So when you look up at this little harmless thumbs up, uh, picture here, right? What for you? For most of you, probably thumbs up means good job. In many societies, thumbs up is like holding up your middle finger. It's not the same thing. If you hold up your thumb, it's like holding up your middle finger. So you can imagine you can really be offending people. So don't use gestures. Um, don't use gestures to communicate. Um, here's another example. Um, the OK sign is not always OK. In some cultures, the OK sign looks like a little a little opening. Uh, in some cultures, that represents a bodily orifice and is highly offensive. And I'll let you guess which orifice it is. Um, again, the thumbs up may be offensive. Smiling does not always mean that the patient is happy or that the person is happy. In some cultures, people smile when they're nervous or ill at ease or even when they're unhappy about something and they're too proud to cry. So, um, for example, I had a, a dear friend uh, from China who's, uh, who during the Cultural Revolution in China, her two twin boys, identical twin boys, were separated. One was sent to the city, one was, uh, was sent to the rural area. And um, in the cities, actually, people had more food than in the rural areas. So these two identical boys, after living apart for a year and a half, one was considerably taller than the other one. The other one was actually stunted in his growth and um, because he was malnourished. And in telling me this story, which was obviously very painful to my friend, she smiled the whole time that she was telling it. She was smiling as she told me the story. And I could tell um, that what she was smiling about was to keep herself from crying about it, that she was simply too proud to be crying about it. And so she smiled through telling me the story. So, you know, again, people smile for all kinds of reasons. They may be nervous. They may be afraid. So don't think that if somebody's smiling, it means that they're happy. Um, winking is flirtatious in some cultures. In others, it signifies joking. Um, beware of of looking at expressions uh, expressions of emotions, um, expressions of pain such as crying are very culturally determined. In some in some cultures, people um, cry a lot even when they're not in pain. In some cultures, uh, are value stoic that value a stoic aspect, and somebody can be in terrible terrible pain and 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 not show it at all on their face. So you cannot read people's facial expressions as a way to determine whether they're in pain or not. If they're and that is very culturally determined. So, um, so in general, when you're trying to communicate across cultures, um, you want to start with their problem. What is worrying you? What is bothering you? And just a, in the ethnic mnemonic, uh, it's useful to find out from somebody whether 
they, it's that they believe that there's the spirits are angry with them or the, or whether um the uh, the woman that was very worried about being late to pick up her her grandson from from school it's very important to engage her in that discussion to see if you can do some problem solving with her so that she can end up staying the full time for dialysis if you don't engage her in the discussion then then she's more likely to simply leave early Include all decision makers. Is there somebody else in the household that's making a decision about what the person is eating or drinking? Include them. Um, ask a combination of open-ended and closed-ended questions. How are you feeling? Are you worse or, or, or better than yesterday? Like the, how are you feeling is an open-ended question. Are you worse or better than, than yesterday is a closed-ended question. Don't Never blame or criticize people. Um, even if somebody hasn't come in for come in for uh, uh, dialysis for a couple of weeks, you don't blame or, or 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 criticize them. What you want to be doing is asking them questions. Tell me about your life. What's happening? What what's keeping you busy? Is there another is there another treatment that they're using? Is anybody encouraging you to come or not come? It's that kind of um, non judgmental asking questions that makes people talk. Um, uh, just another personal example there is um, when I um, I, I um, have a, a lovely daughter whom I adopted from Romania, and she had um, molluscum or little warts on her face when I got her, and had one on her stomach, and and I tried some um, a, a herbal remedy which is to crush garlic and to put it on one of the lesions, and I thankfully chose the one on her stomach. I, I had my my friend and I were reading some herbal, some like natural remedies, and I thought, oh, we'll just try this and see how it works. And it, as it turns out, um, as it turns out, the garlic is a very low pH, and it gave her a chemical burn. And I was so afraid to tell anybody that I had done this that I lied about it. And I will tell you that there may be things that your patients are doing that they are going to lie to you about because they're embarrassed. You need to establish a relationship with your with your um, patients that allows you to tell tell you things that allows you to tell you what they're doing at home. Um, speak at the right educational level. The, the gentleman who didn't understand like what phosphorus is and didn't understand what a binder was, you need to speak at a, a, a kind of level that he can understand. Uh, be careful about negating beliefs and practices. Add, don't subtract. So if somebody believes in spirits, you don't contradict them or tell them that they're wrong. If, you, if somebody believes in the value of, of medicinal tea, don't or argue with them and tell them that that's not effective. Unless Unless, of course, you find that it's harmful. What you do want to do is say, how interesting that you use this medicinal tea. Now let me tell you about how dialysis works. And I think that they're going to work really well together. Um, always use a qualified interpreter and be wary of body language or, or nonverbal communication. Gail, do you have five minutes to finish your presentation? Okay, let me think. Where am I in my slides? Okay, so um, just we want to be careful about l learning about traditional beliefs and practices. You do want to learn about the different spiritual beliefs and practices, but don't stereotype. Not all Haitians use medicinal tea. Not all... Um, not not all people from, uh, uh, for example, the Santarians from Cuban may may uh, use traditional healers. Many many people do not. Um, so be careful that even that even though somebody is from a particular culture doesn't mean that they follow all the cultural beliefs and practices of that culture. If you're from a rural or a or a urban area, you may not. It, meaning to say that the more um, people. The more exposure people have to Western medicine, oftentimes they will um, they will tend to use less traditional medicines, although that's not always true. So most people will simply not believe you if you tell them that a traditional belief that has been passed down for generations is wrong. If the practice is not dangerous, it's best to show non-judgmental curiosity. Contradicting someone else's belief simply shuts off communication. Instead, ask open-ended questions and build trust in order to introduce good health practices. Okay, so um, I, I, I'll just go through this very, very quickly. Um, 
do some more and I know this is true for Florida, that many of your patients that are from other cultures are likely to be either from Latin America or from Haiti. So just very, very quickly, that it's really important that you have um, a general comfort and respect with a whole different whole different kinds of, lots of different kinds of, of cultural beliefs and practices. So, for example, um, some, although I, I think it's a very small percentage of Cubans actually practice the Santeria, and that is characteristic of of uh, of a it is a monotheistic religion it has one god that's the source of spiritual energy that makes up the universe all life and all things and it has emissaries called orishas that are like angels and they uh there's communication with the orishas and humankind and 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 is is accomplished through ritual prayer and offerings so I think I'm just going to go through this very quickly and then take questions. Um, some Haitians practice voodoo, and contrary to what the stereotype is of voodoo, um, it, it's not about and it, no, nobody practices human sacrifices or 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 casting spells or that sort of thing. Typically, people that believe in Haitian voodoo um, are believing in a in a religion that is a mix between African and Catholic beliefs. It has a, a god and it has loa that are special spirits. Um, and there are traditional healers or voodoo priests. They use herbs and faith, faith healing in combination with Western medicine. So if you hear that somebody is practicing voodoo, you should not have a negative reaction, but rather be curious. Tell me more about it. I'm so interested. So I think I think you know I think what probably what we'll do is just go on and just finish up. I mentioned a little bit about the legal, legal and regulatory requirements. It is the law. If your organization receives um, federal funds from the U.S. government, even in the form of Medicare payments, you are required to have formal qualified interpreters, and now the uh, Joint Commission has just come out with its new standards. I encourage you to go to their website and take a look at what the Joint Commission is requiring. And they are um, requiring patients to be treated in a culturally sensitive, patient-centered approach that includes using the, the uh, using a qualified interpreter. So with that, do some more. Is that okay? I feel like I've been talking, 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 talking. Maybe people have some questions or comments. Okay, so give me a, a few seconds, and you're going to mute all the lines, and you can ask questions. Okay. Oh, there they are. <laughs> okay. okay, so do you, does anyone have any questions for Gail? Any questions? Uh, do them where are they supposed to speak or do they type their question in the um the little box? So they can type the questions or they can speak because we unmute all the lines now. Does anyone have any questions? No. No. Okay. <laughs> oh finally I thought that I was talking to myself. Uh -huh. All right, so if you don't have any questions or if later on you have a question, please feel free to uh, email to us and we can email your questions to Tamara Heron. Her email address is C as in Tom, H E R O N at N E W 7 dot E S R D dot net. And we're going to forward the message to Gail.
So, Gary, if you don't have any questions, so thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for attending the WebEx. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.